would you quickly turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew in the 14th chapter, please? Matthew chapter 14. It's been a wonderful night, hasn't it? Amen. Thank the Lord for His goodness to us. And I want to talk to you tonight about what God does in the fourth watch of the night. Really, you've already seen, really, in a lot of ways on what He does. But I want to show you some things about it here from the 14th chapter of the book of Matthew. I'm going to begin reading with verse number 22. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw Him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Amen. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. And said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. And they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Amen. Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. You know, when we look at this particular story here, really, this wonderful story enables us to draw some very yes. comforting conclusions yes. concerning the fourth watch, the fourth watch of the night. At the time of Christ, the Jews had divided the night into four different watches. The first watch was also called the evening watch. Right. It was from three o'clock in the afternoon to, uh, excuse me, six o'clock in the evening, afternoon, evening till nine o'clock. And uh, then the second watch was at, uh, called the Midnight Watch. It started at 9 o'clock and went to midnight. And then the third watch was called the Cock Crowing. started at midnight and went to 3 o'clock in the morning. And then the fourth watch was called the Morning Watch. And it started at 3 o'clock in the morning and went to 6 in the morning. Now Matthew, Mark chapter 13 verse 35 says this. It talks about all of them. Listen. <laughs> Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at right. midnight, right. or at the cock crowing, or in the morning. So we have the four watches mentioned yes, uh, by those names in this 13th chapter. And of course in Matthew chapter 14 we have it by the number of the watch which was the fourth watch. So Mark 6 and Matthew 14 they are parallel passages and they are talking about very vital lessons that happen in the yes, fourth sir. watch of the night. Yes, sir. Now look quickly at verse number 22. We know that Jesus had sent the disciples to go before him while he went up to pray. Jesus was going to a place of intercession there in the 22nd verse. In verse number 23, the Bible said Jesus went up to pray, so he took his place of intercession. And according to Romans chapter 8, verse number 34, that is where Jesus is today. Right. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who maketh intercession for us. Amen? Yes, well, I tell you what, when Amen. Jesus makes intercession for you, it's a big, huge blessing. Yes, Amen? Amen? Can you imagine the comfort that Simon Peter received when Jesus said, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith yes. fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. In the 24th verse of Matthew chapter 14, we see the ship. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. Yes, now I want you to think about the story at hand. The disciples, they're in the ship, and the ship is in the midst of the sea. Yes, sir. And a lot of ways this can give us a picture of the world, of the, of the church, in the, in the midst of the world today. Amen. Uh, it's, it's kind of like that. It's a type, the church, uh, in the world, but it's not of the world. Amen. It's in the world, but it's not of the world. 
world and the disciples, the church, they were being tossed by the waves. And I'm telling you, this world has been brutal to the people yes, of God. And it's not going to get any better. Yes. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So what do we do? Change our positions? Change our doctrine? No. He said, but continue thou in the yes, things sir. which thou hast learned. Amen. So we see that the disciples are in the, in the boat, and the boat is being tossed by the wave, for the wind was contrary. The winds were contrary. That means antagonistic. And yes, sir. Things of that nature there, and to a lot of people, you know, really, uh, and their antagonistic beliefs and teachings that discourage evangelism, sure. and it discourages church growth and outreach among believers and preaching and all those things. Mark chapter 6, verse 48 says, And he saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them, and about the fourth watch of the night. So in a lot of cases, it seems to be what's happening today. Oh, I'm not saying that we're not moving forward, amen. I believe that we're moving forward. If we're living in the will of God and doing the will of God, yes. and we're obeying the Word of God uh, and the Lord Jesus, we're going forward no matter what, amen. But it seems like in this world today, it's getting harder than ever to get anything done. I'm not saying the church is not going forward, but what we're doing is we're facing opposition. We're facing opposition like zoning boards and tax issues and uh, litigation and political correctness and all of these factors. Sometimes it's a lack of interest from the members. Sure. And I hope it would not be like that with you. Amen. Amen. Every, if a church is going to go forward, the members have to be going forward. Yes, sir. The preacher says, I want to get a bus. That means you're going to have to spend some money. And a lot of times people don't like to spend money. Money. Amen. But when something's alive, it takes money. Yeah. Amen. It Amen. takes funds to move something forward. Sometimes it's a lack of commitment why churches are not moving forward. Right. You see, I looked at the generation of my mom and my dad, and though that was a generation, they held uh, Sunday, they held positions like Sunday school teachers and and bus sure. workers and things like that for 25 and 30 years. Yeah. Right. I mean, they just stayed. They stayed in with it. They didn't give up. Up. And whatever they had to give up to serve in the church, they were willing to give it up. Amen. I remember when uh, when uh, my dad wanted to move forward, and uh, we liked to do hunting and fishing. My dad didn't stop fishing, and he didn't stop hunting, but he stopped doing it on Sunday. Amen. Amen. So he just made the changes. You just give up what you what you need to give up to serve uh, in the church. And a lot of times there's too many bench warmers, and there there's not enough players. Amen. Sure. We want the church to go forward. But when we come to this fourth watch of the night here, and especially in Matthew chapter 14, we know that the fourth watch of the night, that three o'clock to six o'clock in the morning watch, it's dark and it's lonely, and a lot of times it can be, be very, very dangerous. At that time of the early morning, the mystery crashes take place. When these automobile, uh, these crashes take place, and nobody knows what's happened. They're just mystery crashes, because when you get to that fourth watch, that three to six o'clock in the morning, it's dark, it's lonely, and it's dangerous. Amen? It's kind of like when the turn, turns of life have tossed you to and fro. Amen? It's like when midday seems like midnight. It's kind of like when you're in the midst of the sea of humanity, but you seem like you're all by yourself, uh, and you're carrying your burden all alone. You know, loneliness is a terrible thing, isn't it? Loneliness, it's a growing problem in our country, in our society, in the world in general. A study by the American Council of Life Insurance reported that the most lonely group of people in America right now are college students. We're talking about having real, real friends flesh and blood friends. We're not talking about social friends. We're not talking about this uh, kind of friendship that just goes on frenzies. That's, that's online stuff. But we're talking about friendships that have depth to it. Isn't that amazing? The loneliest group are college students. And then next on the list are divorced people. And then next on the list 
or welfare recipients, and then single mothers, and then rural students, and then housewives, and then the elderly. Oh, listen, to a lot of times, boy, people, it seems like they're living in the fourth watch of the night. It's a dark time. Right. It's a lonely time. It's a dangerous time. A lot of time, people make very stupid decisions in the fourth watch of the night, in those lonely times when they think that they're all by themselves uh, and nobody else is around, just like, just like the disciples were. They were in the fourth watch of the night. They were in the midst of the sea, and the waves were crashing on the boat, uh, and no doubt they were faced with all these problems and this search situation at hand here, but I want you to notice what happens in the fourth watch of the night. Amen. Jesus, He leaves His place of intercession. Amen. And the sea became a liquid floor beneath His holy feet to rescue His children from the dangers of the sea. Amen. And to a lot of people today, these are dark days. And a a lot of people, they, they, are, they have become doubtful and pessimistic and fearful. Amen. But I'm telling you, listen, I think they're the most exciting days in all of humanity to be alive. Amen. I just count it an honor that God in His divine sovereign will chose for me to be alive right now, 2022. A crazy time to live. But I love it. I'm excited about it. And we don't have anything to be afraid of. Amen. Not one th single thing to be afraid of. Oh, friend, you've got to remember that the dark the darkest hour is just before sunrise. Amen. And in this dark hour, we as God's people should be shining bright. Amen. To a dark world. Amen. Uh, oh, listen. And His church should be a shining city set on a hill for everybody to see. They ought to hear the joy of God in our soul. Ought to see a radiance uh, about, uh, about us, about the Lord Jesus shining in us. Amen. And you know what some glorious day and probably gloriously soon Jesus is going to leave his place of intercession amen and he, the clouds are going to become a vaporous floor beneath his holy feet uh, and he is going to call his children home with a shout amen and it all happened in the fourth watch of the night amen, amen. isn't that amazing I want you to see what happens in the fourth watch of the night what Jesus does in the fourth watch of the night look at at verse number 25, the Bible says, And Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. So the first thing that I want you to take note of tonight is this. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus walks. Amen. He walked over the raging sea. The raging sea was the problem that the disciples were faced. There they were in the midst of this raging sea. The water was crashing the sides of the boat. No doubt water coming in. Lightning flashing across the sky, the claps of thunder. It looked like there's no way, no way. What are they going to do? But Jesus walks, amen, in the fourth watch of the night. The wind and, sea and the waves were contrary, and the boat was no match for it. But Jesus walks right over all of it to go right straight over to his disciples. Jesus, as a matter of fact, he uses the raging sea to demonstrate his water walking power, amen. The raging sea becomes a floor to walk right over them. And I'm telling you, our problems literally they become opportunities uh, to our wonderful, gracious Savior to show Himself strong and powerful and mighty. Amen. So when you're faced with the fourth watch of the night in your life, I'm telling you, Jesus will walk. Amen. Every single miracle in the Bible is predicated on the platform of a problem. If there's no problem, there can never be a miracle. Amen? Amen. Jesus uses the events of the fourth watch to demonstrate his power, walking over their problems to the very things that we cannot, and he helps them. The first thing that Jesus does in the fourth watch of the night, say it with me, Jesus walks. 
Amen. But I want you to look at verse number 27. That's not all he does. The Bible says, um, verse number 27, and Jesus said, be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. So Jesus doesn't just walk on the fourth watch of the night, but Jesus also talks on the, in the fourth watch of the night. Amen. Master, carest thou that we perish? Yes, Jesus cares. Amen. What time I am afraid. I will trust in thee. In God I will praise his word. In God have I put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct uh, thy paths. Amen. Amen. Trust ye in the Lord forever for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Amen. I'll tell you what he does in the fourth month of watch of the night. Yeah. Jesus talks. Amen. Amen. Oh thank the Lord. That's what he does. Amen. Amen. He will talk to us. Amen. And the Bible says and he said be of good cheer it is I be not afraid. Oh, thank the Lord for that. You know, I've found in my lifetime that really God does some wonderful things for us in the fourth watch of the night. Yes. You know, a lot of times the Lord will talk to us through a sermon that just seems like it's just custom made for us yeah. at the right time. Yeah. There are other times where we'll open up our Bible and the verses that we read are just exactly what we need. Yeah. Sometimes it's a particular song. I mean, we just need a song and God will use a song. I remember when I was trying to get the radio station going, man, I had so many obstacles and I just didn't know when you're dealing with the Federal Communication Commission, I mean, we're talking about to run a station, you have to be involved with the Federal Communication Commission, the Federal. Do you understand that? And I'm not talking about Federal Express, all right? I'm talking about the <laughs> Federal Government. There's so much red tape. And I mean, it's just, it gets like uh, 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 crazy sometimes. And I mean, I was running out of time. And I just didn't know what I was going to do. And I had to have my tower issue. I I'd had my engineering done off of one, and when it was all said and done, and boy, they took just so long negotiating back and forth. They said it's going to be $1,200 a month to rent off our tower. That would have put me in the position of compromise starting off the station. I'd have needed money so bad. And I didn't know what I was going to do. And I tell you, I just said, I just don't know what I was going to do. And finally, the Lord... As a matter of fact, he even used a, my, uh, um, used a Valerie's family to help me find that tower. And uh, boy, I, it was just uh, absolutely amazing. And I left a revival meeting in uh, Morris, Illinois, and I was headed home. I finished that meeting. We had a wonderful meeting. A lot of people saved. Just some real neat, neat things, stories that I've told for years now uh, that happened in that meeting. And, uh, and I said to Kim, I'm, I'm going to go to bed. I'll get up early and, and I'll come home, driving home. So I got all my suitcases ready and jumped into bed and tried to go to sleep. And there I am just staring at the ceiling. I just want to be home. I mean, my revival, my work's done. I want to go home. And I'm just sitting there and I've been working hard all week and evangelizing and door to door and preaching. And, but I just am tired. I just want to go home. And I'm just looking at the ceiling and I can't go to sleep. I said, good night. I'm not going to even call Kim. I'm just going to get up. I mean, I can't sleep now. If I, you know, I won't get sleepy driving. Amen. You know, that's how you talk yourself into that stuff. <laughs> so I jumped in my clothes and got my bags and checked out and hopped in my car and headed to the house. And I had about an eight hour drive. I was going to be driving all night. Probably started at about 11 o'clock at night, maybe midnight. And I said, I'm going home. And boy, that whole way home, I just said, Lord, I just don't know what I'm going to do. And I said, now, God, I know I believe so much in you. I believe so much in you that when you created this earth, you knew what hilltop I was going to be broadcasting off of. So I know that you already know it. Now, you're just going to have to show me. You're going to have to show me what to do. And I mean, I'm just in anguish. I'm just praying over this because, I mean, I've just got like about a month, maybe a month and a half, and i got to be on the air. And I don't even have a tower to broadcast off of. And I was driving through Hammond, Indiana, 
and I was listening to the radio station from a church there, and it was probably about 2 o'clock in the morning, and all of a sudden a song came on about Abraham and Isaac and about God providing Himself a sacrifice, and the whole song said, God will provide. Now, of all the times for me to be driving through that Hammond area, <laughs> And for how many ever songs they were playing on that station in a 24-hour period. But God knew that I'd be driving through that town at that time of the morning. And God knew what I was praying about. And I didn't have the answer, and He had the answer. And I'm telling you, I knew it. I got home and I said, Kim, is going to be okay. I just heard a song and it said, God will provide. He does provide. God will speak to you in a song. Amen? He'll speak to you in a song. I remember when we was going through a fourth watch of the night experience with my daughter and my son-in-law, and we'd get, wake up every morning, and we'd wonder what's going to happen today. What are we going to face today? What decisions have to be made today? You just almost hated to put your feet on the floor because you just didn't want the day to start because there was just so many things that you had to face. And I remember one morning I woke up with a, like a song going on in my mind. And the song was, Hallelujah, what a Savior who could take a poor lost sinner, lift him from the miry clay and set him free. I tell you what, Amen. you know what Jesus does in the fourth watch of yes, the night? Sir. He walks. Right. Amen. And you know what else He does? He talks. Amen. But I want you to show you something else here. Look at verse number 31. The Bible says, and immediately, now remember, Simon Peter said, I want, to, I want to come to you. I want to come. And Jesus said, come. And when he came, remember, the wind was boisterous. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Look at verse 31. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. The third thing that Jesus does in the fourth watch of the night is Jesus caught. Amen. So, number one, he walks. Number two, he talks. Number three, he caught. Right. And I'm telling you, he'll catch you. I remember preaching with an evangelist. I don't know him very well, but he's a, he's a wonderful evangelist, a faithful testimony. He had a son that was a very, very gifted athlete. He was smart, he was big, he was strong, and he was tough. And, uh, but he got hurt in the game. As a junior in high school, colleges were already wanting to sign him up. He had natural talent. He was smart, big wide shoulders. I mean, he was like just a perfect cut for a quarterback. Smart and athletic. He could get the job done. But he, got, but he had an injury. He sustained an injury. And in that injury, because of that injury, he was put on prescription drugs to deal with pain. And because of that, it led him to a prescription drug addiction. And that young man, as talented as he was, went down, 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 till he overdosed on drugs. And his dad said to me, Brother Oliver, I was sinking. I was sinking. I felt like such a failure. Here I am, a preacher, an evangelist, and my son, right. he dies this way. He said, I was going down. He said, but Brother Oliver, it's true. Jesus caught me. Amen. 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 That's what he does in the fourth watch of the night. Yes. The Bible says in Isaiah 46, verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Amen. When you're sinking, Jesus can catch you. When you're a panic, in a panic, Jesus can catch you. When you stepped out in faith and life seems to take uh, an unexpected turn, Jesus can catch you. When, you. when you cry for help, amen, and there's nobody around, Jesus can catch you, amen. When you're crying out, cry out to Jesus, amen. What does He do in the fourth watch? He catches us. The Bible says in Psalm 56, verse 13, For thou hast delivered my soul from death. Wilt thou not deliver me, deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? Thank 
God Jesus walks and he talks and then we know that he also will call, we catch us. He caught them. Amen. But look what happens in verse number 31 also. This happens in the fourth watch of the night. After Jesus walks and after he uh, uh, talks and after he caught, uh, look what the disciples did in verse number 31. And said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Now notice in verse number 32, and when they were come into the ship, uh, into the ship, the wind ceased. Uh, amen. And the Bible says there that the disciples exalted him and said unto them, O thou little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the Bible says the wind ceased. Amen. Thank God that the disciples exalted the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what the that's what their position is. Amen. Uh, to uh, uh, excuse me, what I want to say is uh, the, the wind ceased. In other words, what he does is he halted. Amen. He halted the wind. Amen. From fear and anxiety and dread and worry. There's absolutely no need to fret because Jesus can halt everything in your life yeah. that's crazy and insane. Amen. That's what he does in the fourth watch of the night. Amen. But look at verse number 33. The Bible says, and in the fourth watch of the night, disciples exalt. And when they that were coming to the ship came and worshiped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Amen. So after Jesus walks and he talks and he calls and he halts the wind, what did the disciples do? They exalt him. Amen. Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. They exalted his deity. Amen. When we get our eyes back on the Lord Jesus and we experience everything that he is and uh, what he is able to do. Amen. It is a time to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, to exalt the Lord in the fourth watch of the night when it's dark and lonely and dangerous. What happens? Well, the Bible tells us in Matthew 9 and verse 18, the certain ruler, amen, whose daughter was dead, he exalted Jesus in the fourth watch of the night. In Matthew 15, 25, the mother of the mother whose daughter was grievously vexed with the devil, she exalted Jesus in the fourth watch of the night. When the disciples, when they believed the Lord after his resurrection, they exalted him. Amen. Amen. That is our th time to exalt the Lord. Uh, the maniac of Gadara in Mark chapter number five, uh, when he received uh, uh, deliverance from the demonic beings and was saved, uh, he exalted the Lord. And in John chapter nine, the blind man, he exalted Christ in the fourth watch of the night. But I want you to notice the next thing that happens. Look at verse number 35. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all that country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased of the devil. So the disciples started exalting and then they said it's time to do some bringing. Amen. And they brought unto him all that were diseased. Amen. So the disciples exalted and then they brought. Amen. Oh listen that's what he's talking about. Let's go to the woman with the issue of blood. Amen. And she was touched by just healing, uh, just touching the hem of his garment. Amen. We just got to get these precious souls to the Lord. Lord Jesus Amen. Christ. And that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to bring unto him all that were diseased. Amen. Oh, listen, I remember while we was doing an interview of a, of a radio program called the, Go uh, the Children's Gospel Hour. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a uh, recorded right in Greenville, Tennessee, uh, brother Bill Mason. And he told us an amazing story on an interview one time about his program there in one of the radio stations that carried that program. And every day he gives a, he gives a plan of salvation and he gives people an opportunity to be saved. And he said, and one day he said, now we know these children, these are pro programs are designed for children, but we know children are, are not the only ones that listen to them. And he said, we give the gospel out and we are having people saved every day. And he said, and one day a guy called in uh, to the radio, to, the, to the, our, our headquarters and said that he had gotten saved and, was, and wanted to grow in the Lord. And he said, so we began to do a search from where he was, where he lived. He gave us his address. And he said, and we did a search trying to find churches in his area. We did a 10-mile search, no church. 
We did a 20 mile search, no churches. We did a 50 mile search, no churches. We did a 60 mile, no churches. He said we had to go 80 miles out before there was any kind of church that we knew of that would care for people, amen, about their souls. We had to go 80 miles out to try to connect him to a church. Amen. But that's how much Jesus cares for people. Sure. Amen. That radio station, God use it to reach that. Is a, the way I can see it, the way I understand it right there, that was about the only way that he was going to get the gospel. Amen. Unless somebody passing by dropped off a track or somewhere in a restaurant or a bathroom or something, it doesn't seem like there's going to be anybody knocking on his door to give him the gospel. Right. That wasn't a soul went in church 80 miles from where he lived. Amen. But there was a radio broadcast that went right into his home. Amen. Amen. The truth is we just got to get them to Jesus. Amen. Lord. We just got to get them to the Lord Jesus Christ. We got to find ways and think creative. Amen. And talk to people about the Lord. I'm thinking about a friend of mine by the name of Brother Ed Woods. He passed away recently. He's, he uh, worked in the coal mines of West Virginia for a number of years. And uh, he said, I was walking, I was walking to work. And uh, a friend of mine was walking out, and he said, and we all knew he was a Christian. And he said, that Christian man looked at me and said, Ed Woods, you need to get saved. That's all he said to him. Ed Woods, you need to get saved. And he said to me, the Holy Ghost of God, the conviction fell on him so heavy he says, man, I just got under conviction instantly. And he said, I could not get away from it. It was so heavy on my heart. And all he said was, Ed Woods, you need to get saved. Amen. So sometimes we can just try to, fin try to finesse it too much. Amen. We just got to get people to Jesus. Amen. After they saw everything that had happened, they said, we got to get these, we got to get them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, listen, get the drug addicts and the drunkards and the abusers and the bootleggers and the gangsters and the soothsayers. What do they need? They need Jesus. Yes. And the gangsters and the businessmen and the housewives uh, and the rebels, amen, and the self-righteous, what do they need? They need Jesus. Right. And the, and the sinners of all kind. They just need Jesus is what they need. Amen. The Bible said they besought that, 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 and brought unto him all that were diseased. But look what happens next in verse number 36. This is what they did. And besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment and as many as were touched were made perfectly, perfectly whole. Amen. I was holding a revival meeting up in uh, New York. This has happened several years ago now. It was a good revival meeting, and a teenage girl in that church came to me about the second or third night and said, Brother Oliver, I know you are going out and visiting and soul winning every day. Would you go by and see my dad? I said, I said I'll be glad to. And I went out the next day, and I, I forgot to make that visit with the associate pastor. And I came to church that night, and she said, uh, did you get to see my dad? I said, oh, I didn't see him. I'm so sorry. I'll make sure to do it the next day. And um, we went out, and we got busy, and, and uh, I didn't make that call. <clears throat> and that next uh, day, the, uh, that night, that teenage girl said, y'all didn't get to see my dad, did you? I said, oh, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I, I, I promise I will make sure and do it uh, tomorrow. And the preacher and I went out. We got hung up on this call, and the preacher had to get to church. We got to the church, and I said, I can't go. I can't go back tonight. I can't see that teenage girl and tell her that I didn't make that call again. I said, I, I, I won't even show up to preach. So I grabbed the associate pastor, and we went out to make that call. He lived in an apartment complex. I knocked on the door, and this big old giant of a man came to the door. I mean, he was a giant of a guy. Big old giant arms like tree trunks. Big old thick head and neck. Big old full head of hair. His name was Carl. I shook hands with him. I felt like a rag doll on the end of it. I felt like he just shook all of me. Just like, just like he was just big old arms, big old thick hands, fingers just shook my hand like that. And man, I just like, whoa, just rattled my teeth. And I told him who I was and what I was doing. And I said, Carl, I want to ask you about your soul. Do you, know, do you know you're going to heaven when you die? 
And this is what he said to me. He said, I don't know where I want I don't know where I'm going, but I've been wanting to know. And he said, I've been watching religious TV, and I still don't know. Because a lot of times those people, they don't teach eternal salvation. Right. They just take people through a prayer just over and over and over again, and they don't teach them about eternal salvation. And he said, would you come in and talk with me? And I said, I'd be glad to. And me and the associate pastor went in there and sat at, I sat on the couch. He sat on the chair. And I opened up my New Testament. I didn't feel rushed. I felt like he was listening to everything that I was saying. And I took those seven scriptures that was taught to me by my mentor, evangelist Joe Boyd, and I showed him how to be saved. Amen. I showed him uh, Romans 5.12 and Romans uh, 5.8 and went over to Revelation chapter 21 verse 8 and Revelation 20.12 and I showed him about sin and hell and judgment. Then I showed him the good news of that God loved him and gave Jesus to be, him, uh, to be the Savior of the world and I showed him what he needed to do to be saved and I said, Carl, would you, do you want? Do you want to be saved right now? He says, I want to be saved. Amen. I said, well, why don't you pray? He said, well, let's get on our knees and pray right here. And that man bowed on his knees and he asked Christ to save him. Amen. I said, Carl, that's wonderful. <laughs> According to the Bible, God has given you eternal life. Eternal life. It's never going to end. You're his and he's yours forever. And then I gave him some verses on baptism. And I said, we're having revival tonight. Would you come and be baptized? He said, I'll be there. And uh, so I went home. I said, hey, Carl, won't you let, by, let me come by and pick you up? He said, no, I'll drive in. I said, no, 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 I want to come by and pick you up. He said, no, 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 I'll just, I'll drive in. I said, no, I insist. I want to come by and pick you up. He said, no, I'll drive in. I said, yes, sir. Amen. <laughs> Got to the church that night. Carl wasn't there. I knew I should have pushed a little bit more. But about 10 minutes later on, uh, he came into the door. There wasn't any room for him in the auditorium, so they set him in the vestibule back there. My wife was there in this meeting there with me when all this was happening. And I preached my message. People came. It was a good altar call. And then I said, now, if you've been saved and you need to be baptized, come on right now and let's get baptized. And I was kind of looking at him because he said he was going to and he didn't move. It's amazing how bold you get behind the pulpit, isn't he? And boy, I looked right at him and I said, hey, I said, you got saved and you said you was going to be baptized. Come on down here and get baptized. And boy, I just looked, I looked right at him and I tried to look mean. And boy, Carl was looking at me like, who in the world is this guy? But I saw him humble himself. He dropped his head and moved forward. And he came to, the, came to the front of the altar that night and went down to get ready for baptism. The pastor of that church was a little s small guy. His name was Brother Craig, little Scotchman. I mean, when he baptized Carl, it looked like David baptizing Goliath. <laughs> and he said, in obedience to command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of his resurrection, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. But I'm telling you, when he, when he was resurrected out of the water, he really got resurrected. And he shouted out, hand coming out of the water. He said, I'm going Going all the way for Jesus. Amen. Going all the way. And uh, he about caused a tsunami in that little <laughs> baptismal tank there for that preacher there. Oh, listen. They besought him that it only touched the hem of his garment. Amen. And all of that happened in the fourth watch of the night. Yes. When it's dark and lonely and we seem like we're all by ourselves. I'm telling you, Jesus walks and he talks. And he caught and he hauled, and the disciples exalt, amen, and they brought and they besought all in the fourth watch of the night. That's how good our God is. Yes, sir. Amen. He's always been like that, and he'll be like that for me and you. You just got to keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.